My name is Greg Heron, and I'm a mystery writer who lives in New Orleans. And joining me today are four amazingly talented mystery writers, or intrigue writers, or suspense writers, thriller writers, whatever you, whatever, whatever you may deem to name, call them. We all fit into all many dis, def, definitely different dif, definitions of what we write. I'm going to ask each panelist, and I will call on you by name, to introduce yourself and give us a brief background on your your books, and then we'll I'll start winging it from there. How's that sound? Yay, Carson, you're up first. <laughs> I had a feeling that would happen. Um, my name is Carson Tate. I'm um, an author with Bold Strokes Books. I have I was trying to like think how many books I have published, and I can never remember because I'm writing one, editing another, and thinking about the next one after that. But I think it's 28. Um, yep. My latest book is Spirit of the Law. Um, most of my books um, contain uh, some suspense, intrigue elements. I'm a retired criminal defense attorney, and so I pull on my background a lot for the subjects of my books. So you'll usually find lawyers. Um, um, and most of my books are also romances. So they're generally um, romantic intrigue, suspense, thrillers, and mystery. I just remembered our panel title. It's Crimes of the Heart. <laughs> 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 All right. So I'm going to bounce to the other end of the gallery and make Jean Redmond go second. Jean. Oh, thanks, Greg. Uh, much appreciated. Um, yeah, you know, I'm. I actually write as J.M. Redman. Uh, my friends know me as Jean Redman. Uh, uh, you know, sort of that differentiation between the author person and the actual schlub that I act really am. Um, I have written um, twelve books now, uh, two different series. Probably best known for the Mickey Knight series, which is a lesbian noir kind of series set here in New Orleans. The first one came out in 1990. I'm actually one of the earlier, and yeah, I am that old of the uh, people who are writing about lesbian private eyes. Yeah, I'm even older than Greg. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> and next up, we'll go with Carrie. It's Carrie Smith. Great, thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, my name is Carrie Smith, and I am uh, an author with Crooked Lane Books. I've written three police procedurals, starting with um, Silent City, and it's kind of the city series, Silent City, Forgotten City, and Unholy City. Prior to my mystery career, I was a more of a literary writer, and I have one literary novel published as well. And um, so I'm glad to be in this great company. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. And now Cheryl, last but definitely not the least, the amazing Cheryl Head. Tell us all about yourself, Cheryl. Thanks for being with this group. Um, writing in Washington, D.C., I write the Charlie Mack Motown Mysteries, which are set in Detroit, which is hometown for me, but I've been in D.C. 30 plus years. Don't like the city as much as I like Detroit, and so that therefore I don't write about it uh, as much. Um, uh, working on my sixth book that will be released in June and uh, have a couple of standalones uh, in the process of being published. I'm having fun. Awesome, awesome, great. Um, Cheryl, you recently brought your World War II book back into print, is that correct? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, um, that was the first book I wrote. I was, I was working in public media still and needed a diversion from the politics at the office. Um, Ken Burns had just uh, produced the documentary, documentary on the War and when I looked at it, I didn't think it really did justice to the story of Negro soldiers during World War II. My dad was one. And so I started off on the, the track of writing about the normal black soldier in 1943. Most of them did not go to the, uh, the front. Most of them served stateside doing menial tasks, like 85% of the 1 million that served. And so I wrote a story, a love story, actually, about a young man and a young woman from rural America who sign up to go to the army and they serve together um, in a, a fort that exists on the Fort of Chaka, in Tucson, Arizona. And it's a bit of a mystery, a lot of romance, a, a lot of coming of age, and I had a lot of fun doing that, except 
I uh, wanted to be really sincerely authentic to the time, and so I spent a lot of time in the Library of Congress, and I probably will never write this book. People of color tend to be written out of our war histories, don't they? I was, um, I actually was reading an interesting article about how the British treated the American black soldiers better than the Americans. And the Germans and the Italians and the French. Yeah. So everybody. It was quite, quite eye opening to read and unfortunate that I only just now read about that. Ah, oh, well. Um, Carson, Madam Lawyer. Or is that Esquire? Carson Tate Esquire. So tell me, Carson, how did you first get into writing? What made you want to write lesbian romance intrigue? What got you going? Well, I always wanted to write a book. I wrote a book. I wrote a really intricate mystery for um, a girl I had a crush on when I was in sixth grade. Um, <laughs> it was not intricate at all. And it was, <laughs> I just wanted to be able to dedicate something to her. I had this crush. <laughs> So I read this really not very mysterious mystery story, but um, so that's always been like, I've always loved books and I've always loved reading stories and I've always had a lot of admiration for people who can tell stories. And so that was something I always inspired to do, but you know, how you get there is a, I, I think I majored in English, you know, and then everybody tells you, you can't do anything with it. You can't make a living. I went to law school. I did a bunch of, I've done a bunch of different things. I've taught school. I've, I, I avoided this occupation with every other one. <laughs> but I actually think what it was doing was informing my ability to tell stories because I have a lot to pull from now. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as the, when I finally sat down to do it, I'd been reading a lot. Um, I'm a huge Mickey Knight fan. Um, from back in the 90s and um, <laughs> but I remember going to the the bookstore and just buying everything that was out at the time and there just wasn't a lot um, and just consuming it mm -hmm. greedily um, and then one day it was 2007 I said you know I'm gonna write a book this year I'm gonna start writing a book I'm gonna actually do it and um, that was my challenge to myself and that was my first book and amazingly I decided not to write about lawyers or crime or mystery um, because I was doing that for a living <laughs> and so so I I just wrote a, a romance um, and then I I was like why why aren't I pulling from the experience I have so that's when I just started writing uh, romantic suspense and been doing it ever since it's just kind of addictive and do you find it difficult to balance out the romance versus the criminal elements that go on in your books? It depends. If I'm writing a contemporary romance that I'm craving some kind of suspense and, you know, I want to drop a dead body in there or do something that's totally inappropriate for that. <laughs> um, when I'm writing an intrigue, um, then I'm craving the simplicity of a contemporary romance. So. <laughs> It just depends on what I'm doing. But actually, I find that it really, um, like I look back on like the Mickey Knight series. I'm a huge fan of Sue Grafton's Alphabet series. Um, and and all those, you know, female dicks. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the things I really like about them is when they have some kind of relationship arc in them or even if it's not throughout the series, but you know, I'm invested in that character because of how they interact with other people and especially a love interest, because I think that that really tells us a lot about that person. Um, whether it's a, you know, a horribly dysfunctional relationship or a good one, you know, I just think it's a really interesting element to it. And so in writing, I think that it allows me a lot more stuff to play with, you know, to have that in there as well as the intrigue. I think it gives it a lot more breadth. Well, the, the, our panel topic and title actually came from a panel that I was on with Nevada Bar 
and who I actually said her first name correctly. It's not Nevada, <laughs> it's Nevada. And she said that if it, she basically said that the best advice she could ever give a writer is that if it's not romance or it's not mystery, it's just boring. <laughs> which, is, which is where this came from. Carrie, do you, you write police procedurals. So how much, what, what drew you to writing about the police? You're not a cop. Are you? No, no, I'm not. I once dated somebody married to a cop, if that helps. But, um, yeah, I want to read that. But, <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I'm writing that story right now. That goes back when, many years. Um, but I, you know, I was always a P.D. James fan. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, I did not start out as a crime writer. I really started out as a literary writer. And I published a book when I was about 23 and then I didn't publish anything until I was 55 between 23 and 55 um, a lot in, a lot happened in my life but but when but when I came back to writing what I thought was I want to write something that people really want to read that will be engaging that that, that I don't have to you know think it's not never going to be read because nobody really reads literary books very much anymore mm -hmm. um and i and i you know I, I had always just loved the del gleish books and i loved you know what was the what was that series on pbs the mystery um you know that the the mystery series on, on uh, masterpiece theater masterpiece. or mi not what or mystery. Murder. Mystery. Mystery. mystery 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 and um so i um and I wasn't going to do it except that my, my partner, my, my then soon wife to be, um, was, was suddenly in the hospital with lymphoma and it suddenly just like suddenly happened. She got very sick and I found myself, you know, having a lot of time to kill at night while she was getting treatments. And I sort of envisioned this, this cop who was coming back from cancer. And it's like, I was writing my wife into life again, you know? And, um, and so, that's how it started and it took me a lot a lot uh, it took me a while to learn the the basics of the genre because i'm not a cop but i did a lot of research and talked to a lot of people read a lot of books and um that's where i landed <laughs> <laughs> and we're very glad that you did well thank you thank you now gene i know your parents were very your dad was a was your dad a reporter or was your mom a reporter oh. Both my parents were. They met. And both were reporters. Yeah, on a, that, that was what I was going. I was going to say that, and then I thought it was wrong, and I corrected myself, and I was wrong to correct myself. You wrote your first. That happens. <laughs> you published your first book in 1990, and then how have First of all, what, what drew you to writing about Mickey and writing a mystery series in the first place? What drew you to write the mystery series in the first place? Well, when I went to leisure reading, I would go to the mystery series. And you know, you and I have talked about it, but hey, Trixie Belden, Nancy Drew, all that sort of stuff growing up. Um, and I took care of my mother while she was dying of cancer. And one of the things that we could do together was I would read mysteries to her. Mm -hmm. um, particularly that she really liked the uh, Emma Laffin series and some of the others. And, you know, starting the Stu Grafton and, and, and stuff, this was the, the uh, early to mid eighties. Um, and so, you know, I just had this affinity for it. And as, uh, and I think Carson said, you know, as a lesbian, it was like, okay, um, there's a world out there, but I'm not in it. And I wanna, you know, and, and of course I am in it because I exist and my friends exist and all this sort of stuff. And I remember reading, you know, um, these two Grafton books, the uh, Sarah Paretsky books, Marsha Muller. I'm thinking, you know, it, we should have a lesbian private eye. And there were a few, but you know, there were, small publishers and you didn't always find them. Mm -hmm. And at some point I was like, you know, if I want to read one, maybe I'm going to have to write one. I thought, okay, well, what the hell? Let's just pull around and do it. And then Mickey Knight was born and it started out as a short story, which will show in the uh, arc of my first book when I made all those amateur mistakes. And then I, I, you know, I kind of had the conversation with myself, okay, is why would a woman, why would a lesbian become a private eye? Why would you go into that kind of the, the, the iconic noir world of being the outsider, being the person who doesn't get a good day job, you know, she's, she's probably educated because 
I, you know, I, well, I consider myself fairly educated and, and that, you know, of course I have a wife with a PhD, so that's sort of <laughs> that. Um, but, you know, it, it's like, why would she do that? Who, who would she be? What would that kind of person be? And it occurred to me, that's probably someone who's got some issues, particularly around justice and how do you find justice in the world? And how do you bring that chaos back? Mom was a child that um, she had some difficult times. And, and so that was sort of the genesis of, of the books. Okay, awesome. I know we, Jean and I have talked a lot about how we came about writing our books and so on and so forth. So we, we're we know very good. Too much. We know too much. Yes. <laughs> we, know, we know where each other's bodies are buried. And, right. Well, and we have a mutually help, assured destruction pact. <laughs> I am Greg's boss's boss. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So if I do anything, he can get back at me and vice versa. <laughs> yes, it's been an interesting an, an interesting friendship over the years, it's, and one I truly treasure, as I treasure all of you, actually. I've enjoyed knowing all of you. One of the best parts to me about being a part of the mystery community is all the other mm. wonderful people you get to meet and become friends with. Some of them not so much, but then I kill them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part of being a crime writer is you can kill people you don't like in your books. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, Charlie. Charlie is uh, started out as a cop, right? And now she's a private eye. Uh, no, she was never a cop. Uh, she was an agent with Homeland Security. Only. Ah, I'm and, sorry. Uh, my we bad. Defense attorneys call all of them cops. <laughs> <laughs> that that could also be the case. Is the in the question of justice? I think is one that Jean and I talk about a lot. So I'm going to inflict it on y'all as well, Carson. When you're writing about books, the sense of justice from coming from being a lawyer, I would imagine that you take the whole concept of finding justice very seriously in your work. Or am I wrong? No, you're right. And um, I think the thing that I like to explore is, you know, what that what that means, and do you ever really get it? You know, um, a, a win. You know, if uh, I I only practice defense um, on the defense side, um, never as a prosecutor. So I don't have that perspective, but I know plenty of friends who are prosecutors and people I know. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if a case goes all the way to trial and somebody gets a guilty or a not guilty, um, well, one, you don't always know that that's the correct thing. You know, I mean, you don't always know that the outcome is true. And, and you don't always feel satisfied with the outcome. Um, you know, you, you get a not guilty and the client, your client has still had to, you know, their life has been upended. And, mm -hmm. and there are many people who will never believe that that's, that verdict is, is correct. Um, they've suffered financial loss because they had to pay fees <laughs> and, you know, I mean, and pay a bond and, you know, so many different things. And, and so even when you get all the way to the end of the process that we provide, um, you don't always know what the answer is. And so I, I like to explore the struggle of that. Um, just not knowing, you know, how you come to peace with what's happened um, and how you find how justice is elusive. I think that's a really a theme that I like to explore a lot. Okay. And Cheryl, when you, um, eat, Charlie, I do, I did get that she's a private eye, correct, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I told you I really did not prepare. I had a lot. It's, it's been it's been a week, and I really apologize for my unprepared state. So if I make a mis if I say something incorrect about one of your books or your work, and this is a, applies to all of you except Eugene, that um, please feel free to correct me, and I apologize in advance for any incorrect thing or any I might say about one of your books because I'm just basically going off of my memory without. I wanted to spend the morning preparing, but unfortunately, that did not happen. So my apologies. Now, Cheryl, when your character is a private eye, she's a co-owner of the agency. Yeah, she's the um, the principal partner in the agency. That's and why I, we named after her. 
So when she went, so she went from Homeland Security to private act, right? You know, private investigator. Was that a difficult process for you to follow in your work, or not, not so much? Um, the, because of the question of justice that you already posed. You know, in her in her case, Charlie was disheartened by the profiling of Muslims in Detroit uh, after 9/11, and she became an agent. She was in the, the, the inaugural class of agents for Homeland Security. And in Detroit, it's the largest Arab American population outside of the Middle East. Uh, so there was undue, in her opinion, um, profiling of Muslims. She stayed a few years, couldn't stand it because she had developed relationships in that community prior to her work as an agent. And so she decided to go off on her own. And she took a couple other people, people with her to form the agency. Well, one of the things that, one of the things, and Jane Carey, everyone can address this as well, but I'm going to address it to Cheryl first, is um, when you're writing about a private eye, because I do the same thing, only my private, my private eye is not your typical private eye, so I, like I, I can get away with a lot. <laughs> I can get away with a lot that possibly people who are writing more serious private eye or crime fiction can't. I mean, not, there aren't many gay former stripper private eyes. <laughs> <laughs> At least I don't think so. I've yet to be contacted by one accusing me of stealing their life. But one of the issues, one of the, th the changing in technology and since the turn of the century, even going back to the 90s, has completely changed how crimes are investigated, how crimes are prosecuted, what, ev what, what is evidence and what is not evidence. A lot of, one of the things that, for example, you know, anybody, it's very easy to find stuff out about people online. You don't need a private eye to do that. So it becomes more, is it, do you find it challenging to come up to deal with the issues of technology in your books, Cheryl? Do I do, but for a different reason, because my books are set in the mid 2000s, so technology wasn't as advanced. So I'm, I'm dealing with phone technology that sounds really funky and stupid on the page. <laughs> the readers are going, why are they using a Blackberry? You know, <laughs> but uh, so I have to really be careful of that. So, but I picked that time frame because it's a really good point in Detroit's political and socioeconomic trajectory to focus on. Uh, the mayor has been investigated and on his way to jail. Uh, the economics in Detroit are really low. Uh, we've just been named the murder capital of the, you know, the world a few years before. So it's a good time and era to play some a, a crime mystery. And so that's why I did it. So the technology comes up for me, but only in, I'm going like, why didn't they use Twitter? And go like, oh, yeah, there was no Twitter. <laughs> have, you, have you ever made that mistake in a minute? I, my editors will go like, no, no. <laughs> they got to I was trying, I was watching, I actually was watching an old television program from like around 2003 and 2004, a movie, I can't remember what it was, and they had a flip phone. Yeah. And it, and it really, I was like, what the hell? Why, why would she have, oh, yeah, it's in 2005. <laughs> the, the only good thing is those phones then were so heavy, they make actually pretty good clubs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Carrie? What, any issues? Yeah, with yeah, no, um, police procedurals can, can, you can get really killed for getting it wrong, I mean, you know where you're dealing especially with with the police department and the in fact vk powell helped me um on one of my books when i had some questions that were she was really helpful but because and, and the thing is you've got to know what a, you know for example my detective is a new york city an, an nypd detective and you have to know how things work on the nypd it's it's not as if you can um, assume that every police department has access to the same technology or has the same procedures with technology that another police force does. So, you know, you have to really, I, I end up digging and spending a lot of time. I go down a rabbit hole, you know, several times a week when I'm writing a book, um, just trying to find information. And um, yeah, so it's, it's a fun hunt, but it can be frustrating too. Yeah, Jean, what about you? 
you have um, <laughs> you have the what I no, I'm actually your editor and I don't know exactly when your books are set. Are they they're actually set in the <clears throat> No, and that's deliberate. I've uh, I set my books in sort of a vague now. I've been very deliberate about not saying this is the president, this is the sort of stuff because mm -hmm. um I didn't want to really tie myself to that. And then, of course, you know, living in New Orleans, suddenly, boom, we had this uh, major event called Katrina that, that meant I had to specifically time the books because Katrina happened in 2005. Um, but I do try and avoid the, the you know, I'm sort of, you know, again, it's now. Um, if you go to the first books, they become historical because, you know, there, there weren't cell phones back then. In 1990, there, there, there were those huge clunky things that, you know, you had to get um, you know, your bodyguard to carry for you if you had a bodyguard, which I didn't, um, you know, or muscle man. Um, and then moving on to, you know, the car phones and cell phones and stuff and that. And so I've sort of updated and, and, and kept it contemporary because I'm just too lazy to go and do the research and figure out what kind of cell phones were available three years ago. Um, but I don't, I try not to put my books in a specific time frame other than the clues like, you know, what kind of book and what kind of cell phone is she using? I mean, these days you really have to deal with it and you have to deal with the, why is your private eye in trouble when she has a cell phone? You know, you can do all these sort of things, what's going on with that and really be thoughtful about it. And, and you certainly don't want your character to be stupid unless you really want your character to be stupid because there's nothing more annoying than that plot twist when someone who's supposed to be uh, uh, with it, uh, protagonist suddenly forgets that they have a cell phone um, mm -hmm. to call back up or to call whatever or to, you know, that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, and you know, and, and I think COVID's gonna be another challenge for us because how do we write about COVID? Yeah. And I haven't quite figured out in the <laughs> book that I'm working on because, you know, you're working on books, you have it in your, in your, your head and then suddenly Katrina happens or COVID happens or other kind of stuff happens. And suddenly as a writer, it, it's like, how do you how do you incorporate that? Do you, do you not? Greg, you know, as you and I know, we've had friends who were just like, I can't write about Katrina, I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the rest of us did. And a lot of, I know a lot of New Orleans writers really, really struggled and some of them even kind of disappeared for a while. Yeah, some have never come back, actually. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Carson? Well, I've, I was, thinking about what you said about Katrina and um, my biggest time stamp in my novels is restaurants, I think. Um, <laughs> Gasp. <laughs> I like to eat, so my Wow, gosh. I never knew. <laughs> and um, so, you know, the biggest thing I think that'll come from COVID for me is, you know, like, I have to think about what places are not open anymore, which is yeah. that. Um, but I'm, I'm always writing in the now, um, but I don't refer to, like, I've, I've written enough books that I'm able to populate um, the world with my own people. So, like, I've written a set of political thrillers, so I have my own president. And Can I move into that world? <laughs> Uh, www.carsontate.com um, but but the technology is interesting because um, there is so much that can be done I mean there's so much the police can do and the, the trick is can do um, it kind of refers back to what Carrie was saying everybody has access to different technology and, you know prosecutors we, we used to always bring up with juries um, CSI and things because prosecutors hated it because you know they don't have a crime scene van go out to every crime. I mean that just doesn't happen. They don't have the resources for that. But if you let the jury know that that's possible and they maybe should have done that, you know. <laughs> but but readers think, you know, readers consume a lot of media and they think, well, why aren't they doing it? So you either have to do it or you have to explain why you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you really have to think about this. It's 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 interesting because when you, you, you say that, um, I had an experience 
in the last year where I was having to deal with a lawyer on a, new, a legal issue. Very sorry. Um, <laughs> actually, it was a, it was more of an issue because I'm so stupid about the law. <laughs> and there was literally a moment in the conversation when I was asking questions of the lawyer and he said, forget everything you've seen on Law and Order, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, that's not what you need to be concerned about. Don't. I will tell you when you need to be worried about something. And I was like, okay, great, thank you. Which, you know, that's but, like, I think with as much media as there is now, and I'm talking about, you know, Netflix, Hulu, you know, there's just so much to consume that, that all consumers of anything, you know, real estate, you know, you're gonna hire a realtor and you're like, well, how do you charge so much? I could do this on, you know, you know, that there's just, there's that barrage of information and everybody assumes that it's true, which is another interesting thing to explore. You know, what, how do you, how do you determine what's true in a world where yeah, barrage with all this information and no way to verify it? Right. It, it, like people also, like a very common distinction that people do not make about our legal system is you are not found innocent. <laughs> you are found <laughs> guilty and there's a and there's a significant difference between yep. the two Cheryl and when you're on um... I was just gonna say break on that point in my experience mystery readers and crime readers are really discerning too I, I, I think they're not as forgiving as readers of no means you know they they will call you on something and they go like that's not possible your plot is <laughs> <laughs> yes they do and I there's something about I think because there's a reality to that too because our readers generally are fans of our genre and it's all about figuring it out yeah. it's the puzzle they want to see if they can be outfit they, they can figure out what the author is doing before the author actually does it and then based on their other books that they've read and based on the tv shows and movies and etc that they've watched well, on Law and Order, no, I'm not writing an episode of Law and Order because I'd be making a lot more money. <laughs> when, Cheryl, when you're when you you say your books are you said your books are set in the mid to to the aughts, I guess is what they call them now. Do you specify which year, or is it is it just kind of vague? Because I have, I have so far. Um, the other element, the other time element for me is Charlie's mother has early onset Alzheimer's, so. I realized pretty quickly that I'm going to have to also have her diminish it be part of yeah. the yeah. plot line, which I hate because I love Ernestine. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's, um, that's another consideration for me. But the, the current book is set in 2009 because I wanted to make a, a point about how Michigan all the writers came to be. So I wanted to set it in the first year of Obama's presidency. So, I, yeah, I'm pretty much going chronologically through the series. I, I don't know if I'll continue to do that. I might take a leap, but I also don't want her to die or to die. Well, one thing that, like Michael Nava is doing now, yeah. Michael Nava originally wrote and ended his series in 2001, I believe. The last book came out in 2001. And now he's gone back and brought the series back, but rather than chronologic following the series after the last book, yes. he's gone back in time. Mm -hmm. The early years kind of thing, which is great because with your year boundaries, you can always go back and do, well, I can do 2007 this year. I'm writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> that was always, I had always, my books had, I had always said that my books were set in the amorphous now. It's, you know, and I was never going to, and I never was going to deal with explaining technology changes. It just was going to be, <laughs> oh, we didn't have cell phones back then. We have them now. So I'm just not going to mention any of that. My first book, he calls the cops when he finds the body from a pay phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh I had I'm no trying to idea. find one of those today. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, that which brings back the whole you know the issue of pandemic do we want to address the pandemic in our work cheryl obviously you can put that off for as long as you want yes 
you got years to go before you get to the pandemic. But I know that I've seen a lot of people, as Jean said, I've seen a lot of people saying that they don't want to deal with it. And I didn't understand that and that people don't want to write about it. But we've, I just draw from my experience with Katrina in that I didn't want to write about Katrina either. I didn't want to write about post New Orleans Katrina. It was, I was living it. I didn't want to write about it. But it, it was incredibly cathartic to do so because I was able to get a lot of issues that I didn't even realize I was experiencing getting it worked out by going through it with my characters. And I think I, I probably will do a pandemic book. I'm kind of screwed right now, though, <laughs> because my last Scotty book was the Christmas before the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and then three months later, it's like, okay, well, if I don't do the pandemic, it's got to be in that window, <laughs> that little window. So what am I going to do? And how many books can I fit into that little the window? The Mardi Gras right before. What a harbinger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And because I'd want, I'd actually wanted to do a book about that Mardi Gras gene because I was about the Hard Rock Hotel. Collapse. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And I was going to put that into my Mardi Gras book. And now I'm like, OK, well, now I'm going to have to write a bunch of books in that period of time <laughs> until I know how, what to Monday do. Monday book, it. Tuesday book, Wednesday book. <laughs> it's like, yeah, those bodies are dropping out of the sky in New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> Pandemic hits before everything shut down. But it's also kind of one of those things, too, where um, I'm, with the pandemic, with Katrina, at least at the point by the time that I had, was starting to write about Katrina, we were starting to see the recovery start in New Orleans and things were starting to change and people were starting to come back and we were starting to have events again and things were opening up again. And so there was a sense, there was a hopeful sense when I was writing. It's like, even though this is a very dark and grim topic, there's hope. I don't know if we're at that place right yet. What do you think, Carson? Are we at a place where we can see a hopeful end to this so that we can write about it in a way that's not going to depress the hell out of the reader or, or turn them off completely? Not me. I mean, I, I'm a pretty optimistic person, um, but I just, and I think we'll get on the other side of this at some point, but I don't, I don't have any interest in incorporating it into my work right now. Um, I could see maybe handling it in a standalone some other time when we're past it, but maybe even in a way that just talks about that that happened and we're mm -hmm. past it. I mean, you know, the, the romance element makes it a little difficult for me to handle it too, <laughs> um, unless I want to make it about that, you know, like about yeah. how you handle a, a romance. Pandemic romance. And I'm just not it doesn't interest me at this time. Um, I do think it's, I mean, it's it's affected every aspect of everything. Um, you know, I was watching, I don't know what maybe I was watching, but I was like, all oh, those people are standing so close to each other and it's, it's really bothering me. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm just, if the idea strikes me, I'll, I'll take it on. But right now I don't wanna bring it into any of the worlds I have um because those are my safe place safe places and i don't we don't want to mess with them right now how about you carrie what do you think well you know i don't really i don't really see myself writing a pandemic book i you know I, there's been a lot that's happened in the last year and i think that what what is a, i mean obviously like everyone i've been affected by the pandemic but i think that what's what's been more sort of shaping where i'm going is more the social justice movement and and you know the Black Lives Matter movement and when I, you know I grew up like like Cheryl I I grew up in Michigan I grew up in Gross Point Michigan which you know it, which is right next to Detroit but a world apart and lately my mind has been going back in time to all the messages that I got when I was growing up in the kind of family that I grew up in and. I'm starting to go there and trying to figure out what that all means and deal with that in my writing. Um, and I and I feel like 
you know, that's where I'm being pulled right now. It's not necessarily, you know, mystery writing, but that's where it's, that's where I'm going right now because that's where I find like, like something that matters. So, you know, I don't feel almost in some ways, I feel like I'm, I'm writing historical fiction because I'm so old (laughs) and I'm talking about the 19, you know, late 1960s and 1970s of my childhood. And, you know, my parents, well, here I go confessing, you know, my parents voted for George Wallace. So that's the kind of, you know, I, I really understand the Michigan militia and all of that, that world out there. I get that. Um, And it's why I came to New York. So I'm going back there to try and explore that a little bit. That's, that, I'm so glad that you segued into social justice because that was something else I wanted to bring up. So well done, Carrie. I, Thank you, Greg. <laughs> whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, and I, I totally understand that as well. My parents, are, we're from Alabama. My parents voted for George Wallace as well. I grew up in Chicago mm-hmm. in the 1960s. That was my childhood was Chicago in the 1960s yeah. with the rioting and the right the Democratic National Convention in 1968 and all of that. And the message, like you, I was getting, the kind of messaging that I was getting as reality has had to been unlearned as an adult. Exactly. And it's an ongoing process. Yes, and I'm absolutely. kind of going that direction myself with some of the mm-hmm. stuff, my writing too. I'm doing some short fiction addressing social justice issues in the book that I am waiting for my editor to get back to me about <laughs> great, kind of addresses great. that whole rural Alabama yeah. mentality thing and, and, and dealing with it in the modern day and how it was in the past. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I did it right. And that's part of the reason I'm so nervous about hearing back from my editor because I don't know because of sure. Sure. what's in my head from childhood but mm-hmm. so i think that's a i think that's an interesting place to go um what about eugene social justice pandemics what what, do you, what, what you got going on there girl boy uh <laughs> so much stuff to be back um i think the difference with katrina is katrina there was uh, a clear set of the waters came water stayed, then the waters receded. And then we could move into seeing what was left behind in the water Mm -hmm. and then figuring out how do we start rebuilding or moving on with our lives. So there were clear places to step on, you know, little, little small stones in this stream of uncertainty that you knew this was the way. And with the pandemic, it's been so much, much different. Um, You know, I think Greg, you and I, obviously in our day job is in public health. It's like, well, okay, who knows what's going to happen now? How do we figure this out? Everything's changing. We don't know what's going on. You know, what's the virus going to do? All the variants are coming out. You know, this constant sense of churning and uncertainty. And for a writer, that makes it very hard to do. And it's one of the reasons I've been reluctant to go into it is I don't even know what to make of it personally. You know, and even with Katrina, as you said, that, that was that was challenging and hard. So for writing about it, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of setting the book sort of in that moment when we're just starting to come out of it, when we're starting to come back. And for private detectives, uh, well, I think for anybody, but still so much is human interaction. And how do you interact, you know, when you can't, when you can't go and interview somebody? You know, how do you do this sort of stuff? Um, and, and social justice, yeah, I think that's something that we all need as writers to take the risk to challenge it because if we don't, who's going to? Um, some of you may know I have another series, uh, which unfortunately is on Hayes because the publisher went out of, decided not to publish any mystery uh, and mysteries again. But the first book was set in a small Mississippi town like the one I grew up in. And the protagonist was a newspaper editor whose um, husband had uh, family founded the newspaper a long time ago and she'd come back to that small Mississippi town to be with him and to you know raise their children and work, work on the paper. Um, and they discovered the skeletons of three people that turned out to be civil rights workers who supposedly had gotten on a bus and left and never been seen again. And so she has to uncover all the skeletons and that was a huge dive into a very ugly past. Um, and I can say, you know, someone's always lucky, you know, my, my 
my paternal paternal grandmother, the one here in New Orleans, was like, we have we can only use this this cab driver this cab company because they only hired white drivers. On the mm-hmm. other hand, my mother, the Indiana woman, uh, was like, you know, in the eighth grade when Mississippi still still had not completely desegregated school. So I was still in a segregated school. Um, it, the assignment was, you know, ask your parents, you know, someone in historical that they really respect. And my mother said Eleanor Roosevelt. And I, you know, 13 year old eighth grade, I didn't know as much about Eleanor. I knew, you know, she was the, the social justice. And then looking at her history of, you know, going in an airplane with a Tuskegee Airman, fighting, you know, resigning from the Daughters of the American Revolution. So I had those two sides of the family pulling me in various directions. And, you know, I I hope that my mother's direction is the one that keeps pulling me. But yeah, I think, you know, the book that I'm working on now, and I'm sort of just into it, uh, the tentative title is Transitory. And Mickey is walking, stumbling home from the French Quarter after the bars have finally really reopened and watches a car come by and throw somebody out who turns out to be a black trans woman who dies. Mm-hmm. And that's the opening of the book. Ooh, can't wait, can't wait to edit that. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's gonna be really challenging because I'm gonna have to write about people that I'm not of, I'm not, that's not where, you know, I'm a white woman who grew up in a certain age and all this sort of stuff. And how do I get into that, those worlds? And I think for us as writers, that's the really challenge again, because if we can't imagine it, how do we get there in real life? How do we imagine people as fully real people? And I think that's a struggle for so many of us is that we have a world that says this group of people, white straight men are real people and the rest of us aren't quite real people. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure we others need to talk. I I um, have been watching It's a Sin this week on HBO. Oh yeah, me too. Mm. I binged it. What did you think? It was incredibly painful. It was incredibly, incredibly yeah. painful. I think it was the first time I've ever seen that narrative of the 1980s where the characters were the age I was. Yeah. At that yeah. time. Yeah. Because usually, and I, this isn't I, to be critical of previous work, but right. the vast majority of HIV AIDS pandemic fiction, nonfiction, film, et cetera, is usually from the perspective of a 30 to of a gay white gay man in his 30s and 40s. And so I wasn't really prepared. I knew it was going to be hard. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't prepared for how hard it was going to be yeah. because mm-hmm. you forget how young everybody was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oof, that was a pleasant note. Cheryl, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that series, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up. Um, so like Carrie, I, I'm more impacted by social justice. I mean, a, a year from a year ago in February, we were really kind of yeah. really George Foreman. And I, had, I didn't have COVID on my mind so much until March when I thought I was going to die every day. So, but, but, I can't do that. Uh, but so I started, I, you know, I was so angry that I started working on um, a standalone novel that's done and still needs to be edited and is, don't have a publishing deal yet. But the title is Time's Undoing, working title. And it really is a parallel story set in 2019, so I could avoid writing about COVID. Mm-hmm. And 1929, and it's looking at a historical murder of a black man by the Birmingham Police Department, mm. Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> Greg, so this conversation is so interesting to me. Um, and it's b- uh, based a little bit on, a, on my own family's history. My great great grandfather was murdered by Birmingham Police in 1929. So I've always wanted to write about the story. I had maybe too much pain, too much um, uncertainty, too much missing, too many missing pieces to write. But the impetus of Foreman's murder on top of Floyd, all George, 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 George Floyd, George, George Foreman, uh, sent me to to that. George Floyd. I'm sorry, I keep saying Foreman. I'm thinking about boxing for some reason. George Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> sent me to, to that, that storyline. And so it's, it's interesting. I'm, you know, the, the protagonist is um, 
the great great granddaughter of the man who was killed and she's a reporter for the Detroit Free Press so I have still have my Detroit element and she mm -hmm. goes in search of the truth about the murder of the great grandfather and I, I found that I like writing the 1929 sequences even better than the 2019 sequences so wow that sounds interesting that that's, I'm looking forward to reading that. Yeah. Get a deal yeah. soon. <laughs> you, as an order. <laughs> All right. Oh, look at the time flew. Wow. We're almost done, y'all. Um, so I'm going to leave, give us a, I'm going to give everybody one more opportunity to talk about what you want, what you, what your most recent work is, where they can buy it, and what you're working on now. Carson, I'm starting with you because I know you want to get out of here so you can have lunch. <laughs> I always want to have lunch, like <laughs> any time of the day. <laughs> right there with you. <laughs> so um, this book, Spirit of the Law, was released just a couple of weeks ago. It's um, a prosecutor who's forced to work with a medium. Um, because I love the show Medium, and I was just wanting to incorporate that in a book. Um, and I have a book coming out in June, um, Her Consigliere. It's a mob mob book. So. All righty. Jean, what was your most recent book? Okay. Oh, how soon our editors forget. <laughs> <laughs> Not Dead Enough. Uh, it was a big, the Mickey Knight book, the latest Mickey Knight book, uh, and it is out and you can get it at Bold Strokes Books or your local independent bookstore can certainly order it for you. Awesome. And you're working. No idea when the next one's going to be dropping in my inbox, huh? Yes, uh, late <laughs> summer, early fall. Oh, yep. thank you for not saying after your employee evaluation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Carrie, how about you? Well, the latest book is the third um, Cadella book, Unholy City. I love which... that cover, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the Bethesda Fountain in Central Park. Um, it's a it's a locked room mystery about uh, Cadella goes into a Upper West Side kind of social justice Episcopalian congregation, and it's the night of a vestry meeting, and the vestry head guy is murdered in the garden outside the Ooh. on the grounds of the church. Um, and right now, I'm shopping. The, the book I'd love to sell, but I haven't sold it yet, is called Donor 795. And it is a murder mystery um, in which a young woman, um, daughter of lesbians, uh, is contacted by her, by one of her half siblings who she doesn't know, but she's contacted on a 23andMe type site called mydna.com. And right after they meet, he turns up dead and she has to solve the mystery. Mm. So if you know anybody who wants to buy that book, definitely let me know. <laughs> All right, Cheryl, let's see it. Well, this is uh, the book that's out now, book five. Um, book six will be out in June. And that's the one, it's called Warn Me When It's Time. That's the one that looks at the, the nascent um, beginnings of the, the crazy people who thought they could kidnap the Michigan government go governor. And said in 2009, uh, the first, uh, the first year of the Obama uh, presidency, which gave everybody, you know, all the crazy people, uh, reason to come out from undercover. Yeah. I love your titles, Cheryl. They're awesome. The best titles. <laughs> and I'm a title guy, so <laughs> I'm all about the titles. Those are, are you, do you ever worry that you're not, you're going to get to the point where you're not going to have one that fits the rhythm? I have a 48 of them. Oh, <laughs> well done. Yes, 48 more That's at awesome. least. <laughs> awesome. Well, on that note, I'm going to bring this to a close. Thank you all very much for being so witty and charming and entertaining and putting up with my nonsense as your unprepared moderator. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to talk to incredibly smart, talented women. I wish I could go on, I could do this all day, but I'm sure we all have other things to do. <laughs> it's great to be with all of you. Yeah, yeah. likewise. Thank likewise. you so much. <laughs>